I'm your host, Josh Turner, and this is PRT. That is what we call it. So folks, we have a show for you tonight, of course, like always, but before we do that, I got to tell you, I've asked and I've asked and I've asked, if you send me a friend request on Facebook or Instagram, please let me know that you are a listener of the show. Josh Turner 940 on Instagram is where you can find me, Josh Turner 940. Facebook, just look up Josh Turner. You'll see my my ugly mug there with my beautiful wife, and, and that, that's my profile pic. That you can just you can go and find me. Uh, here's the thing: we have a conference coming up September first, second, and third. The first is for VIP. Second and third is a regular conference. Uh, not regular because there's nothing regular about it. It's going to be a great time. Uh, get your tickets because they are now selling way way faster than they were a few months ago. They are now moving at a considerable clip and so you may uh we're about to sell out of vip pretty quick i I think we probably as of the time this is recorded i think we may have uh, a few more but you're going to want to get those while you still can and then we'll just have the regular seating but uh it is definitely moving quicker as the is the conference nears now here's the thing we have suspended um, doing the giveaways until after the conference. Once the conference is over, uh, you know, and then we can do the giveaways again. But until then, we're, we can't because we, we, we need all the merchandise to take to the conference. That's why somebody was asking about that, a, a several somebodies, and that's why I'm not dropping them. But you go to the Paranormal Roundtable group on Facebook. That's typically what we do. We'll drop the show there. You leave a comment, and we'll give you something. And if you join the Patreon, if you're a $10 tier, three months, you get a swag bag. $20, $20 tier, you get a swag bag instantly. $30 tier gets you a super swag bag. $40 tier gets you a super ultra swag bag. And if you get, go higher, if you want, but if then it's super duper super ultra, ultra mega swag mega bag. Mega swag bag. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and I, I'm going to say this. If you go above 40, I'll automatically send you a copy of my book, or one of my books anyway, um, which are coming out. As of this recording, they should be available probably within a couple days of this. Werewolves and the Dogman phenomena may or may not already be out when this comes out. And then Bigfoot uh, will be out probably this this week. What's the name of the Bigfoot book? Bigfoot Phenomena. The Bigfoot Phenomena. And Werewolves and the Dogman phenomena. So those books, they I did. And I want to say this for the podcast listeners who don't listen to the YouTube uh, channel. and, And shame on you if you don't because you're missing out. We do a live stream of, of about three hours on Friday, and we have a guest every Friday, and they talk about you know their show or their their research, their investigations, and their books where they've written and papers they've written, whatever. We just have a discussion. We have a discussion with them, and then on Sunday we tell stories, and so those are stories you're not going to get on here on the podcast. But if you listen to us on Spotify, that's fine. But check out the live streams too. Continue to listen on Spotify and then just go to the live streams, whatever. Um, But be sure and and listen. However you listen, that's great. Now, one of the things I got to tell you, if you are interested in sending me a story, the the, the easiest way to do it is through email, which is joshturnerprtpodcast.com. That's joshturnerprtpodcast.com. The Patreon, what are the coordinates for that, Anthony? It's patreon.com slash BRT podcast. Yeah. And so you can you can hit us up on Patreon. It's a great way to support the show and get you some cool merchandise and an autograph book from one of many authors that we deal with. Um, and those authors, most of them will be at the conference. And I'm talking about Chad Lewis, Nick Redfern, Kim Gerhardt, David Weatherly, Lyle Blackburn, Barton Nunley, 
My gosh, uh, who else? Ron Murphy. Ron I mean, Moorhead. those are just authors. Ron Moorhead. Too. I mean, if we really Bettina Moss. I mean, we, we have the podcast scene. It's really just a who's Josh who Minocchio. of paranormal. Mm-hmm. And it's really cool. But another reason why you should listen on YouTube though is all the information that we previously discussed will be found in the YouTube description. So if you ever need to find any of that, you can just go right to the description, and then you'll lead you. It'll lead you right to those spots. True, true, true. Well, without further ado, let's get started. So today's episode, um, uh, I mean, th- I'm excited for this one because we've been building it up. It is another vampire show. And I don't care if you don't believe vampires exist. Okay. I'm going to tell you right now, somebody was kind of heckling me and they said, and, and it was a, a friend of ours. I'm not going to say his name. Um, John, but anyway, w- w- he was heckling us. And one of the things that I said to him, I said, why don't you believe that you believe in dog, man, werewolves, whatever, because, you know, his brother claims to have seen one out near Lockhart uh, or on the other side of uh, Luling. I said, but what about vampires? He said, well, I don't, I don't believe in vampires. And I said, why not? He says, well, you don't get people talking about it. I was like, you know why? Because they don't know what they're looking at. They don't know what they're seeing. So they don't really know to call them that. And vampires can blend in with humans like, you know. We did the show with Kirk Reed on last Friday, and Kirk talked about it. And on his show, Abnormal Investigations, him and Mike, I mean, they do a great job. They were talking about vampires. Um, And you're starting to get more and more people that are talking about these things. But it is a scary and creepy subject. Most of the time when we get a story about vampires, we don't go, okay, uh, this person says, I saw a vampire. You know? We just kind of say, okay, let's classify this as a gargoyle, a vampire, whatever. Today, I was, and I showed you, Anthony, I was looking through my Instagram, and I saw somebody had sent me a story um, about a vampire in Las Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, her brother was a cab driver. And it was creepy. I mean, it was a creepy story. When you read these stories, though, you get tons of them. You got to decide, what is this? Is this going to fit into the category of a vampire or whatever it is? But today I got some stories. So I decided to go international on this one because we had one out of France, which was in Paris, France. And then we had one in uh, Brazil. And I'm not even going to attempt to try to, um, exp- I mean, I don't even know how to explain it. And then one out of Portugal. Now, the one out of Portugal was, I think, we'll start with that one. It was very intriguing, and I'm going to tell you this, man. If, if you don't believe in vampires, that's fine. You don't believe in vampires. Not everybody's going to, they're not everybody's cup of tea. Some people don't want to hear about it. They, it scares them, or they don't believe that, um, that they can, that they're, they exist. They don't want to believe that it's real, and that's fine. But I'm going to tell you right now, after hearing some of the stories that I've heard over the years, I absolutely believe that they exist. I believe that they do what they do. I believe that they are just like the reptilians. They walk among us. And some of these things kind of blend in, like the reptilian, vampire, I don't know. One of these, I'm going to tell you tonight, is kind of in that category of a reptilian, vampire, hybrid type of creature. I, I, I don't even know what to call it. This one happened right outside of Lisbon, which is the capital of Portugal. And this guy was working, he was a uh, carpenter and he was working on a subdivision right outside of there. And what he said happened would scare the crap out of anybody. I don't care who you are. It would scare the crap out of me and anybody else. They were building an apartment complex. And he said this was like back in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, that, that, that was like, I think it was literally 99, 2000, something like that. And he said that he was, he was the electrician. His job was to put the electricity and he was working late one night. The first, the first encounter he had with what I believe was a vampire was he heard something scratching on the other side of the wall and he was like, what the heck is that? And it was a clicking noise. And so he was doing the wiring and he had two guys with him. He had a crew and they were on, the, but they were on other buildings and two other, there was just like a string of buildings. Right. And he said, dude, I heard this clicking noise. And then I heard a like a, 
And, and that's exactly what he did. He tried to tell, he tried to like tell me the, uh, you know, your work you're doing over the app. What's it called? The what's, uh, what's it called? The WhatsApp, whatever. Oh yeah. What's up? So you're trying to talk and this guy's trying to, you know, he's doing the, 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 the sound effects and it was kind of fading in and out, but I got what he was saying. And, uh, and, and then he asked me, I was, I was like, I really didn't catch that last part. And I thought it was like something wrong with the phone, but he was trying to do the sound effects. <laughs> and, it, and so he's telling me this and I'm listening to this guy and he says, dude, he's got a thick accent, but I got the gist of what he was saying. And he said, dude, this, this thing, whatever it was, there was, it was like, he thought it was a large bird had made a bunch of noise and he goes, and I go around the other side of the wall, there's nothing there. But that scratching, whatever it was, he said he looked and on the wall, there were like scratch marks, like somebody had scratched with their hands, you know, like, like five, like four fingers scratches. And he's like, well, that's weird. You know, like deep, deep scratches into the uh, drywall. And so a couple of days later, one of his guys calls and says, man, I'm not going back to that site. I saw something crazy fly by one of the buildings and I, through the window. And so his guy quit. And so they, they were working at night, you know, working through, you know, trying to get done, you know. And he said, dude, I, I, he goes, I just, I just was like, no, we're not going to work. You know, they're pushing us to do it. And we told them, no, we're not going to do it no more. You're going to have to, we're going to work during the day. And so they said, look, we got to get this done. We got to get this place built. They, they offered him more money. <clears throat> now, they did have something really crazy happen. When they were building this place, this is what he told me. He said, that w right, right when they first started the job, one of the drywallers told him when they first started putting up the drywall in the first building, he said they found a, basically a, a, a person that was a tr like a drug addict. You know, they could tell the person had track marks and everything else. His, his body was pale white. And they literally, when they called the police, he was dead, obviously. They said that he had been exsanguinated and there were puncture marks all over his body, not from the needles or whatever, but that this guy had been drained of his blood. Every ounce of his blood was gone. And so the police just said, oh, it was a homeless drug addict. And they came and they took the body and that was it. But it, it really spooked everybody. Everybody was freaked out. So they were like, what the heck is going on? Then. They get a report of another guy who was working as one of the plumbers, the, the initial people on the on the site, who claimed that they were attacked by some sort of flying humanoid that had swooped down and had literally clawed the back of one of them's neck. And the plumbers were freaked out, so they quit. So then he went to the superintendent. He says, is there something I should know about this site? Because now my guys are complaining and we've heard stories. He says, oh... You let those stories get into your mind and that's why you're, and you're scared because of the stories, you know? And so you're buying into all this, it's mentiras, this bull crap, you know, whatever, however they say it, you know, it don't, you know, it's, it's a bunch of bull crap, you know, don't, don't believe none of that. And he, he came to the realization that this guy was putting him on because he knew something was wrong. Now he said that at first he thought his mom was playing tricks on him because he did, he did hear the stories and he thought, but when he saw the claw marks on the wall, he went through the building and he saw them in different places. And he said it was almost like they had a design to them. Like they were like, it wasn't just random claw marks. Like you could see that there was something there. Like it was like in a pattern almost. And like in an X shape, you know what I mean? And so he thought that's odd. You know, he never did really figure that out. But what happened was they, they offered him double. They said, look, just finish the job. We'll pay you double. Just get it done. We have to get this done. And he had worked with this guy before as a contractor. And he said, look, this guy was a good payer. So he didn't want to disappoint the guy. And he said, okay, you know what? I'll do this. I'm going to get it done. Don't worry. We'll do it. And so he went up there with his brother who wasn't a master electrician, but he knew how to do the job. And so he said, okay, I'll just take my brother up there because his crew quit. Okay, after they saw the thing fly, flying in the window, which was literally hovering in the window, and I'll get to a description in a minute. He's like, my brother was in one building, I was in the other, and I hear a scream. He goes, and I run down the stairs, and I go back up the stairs to the building next to me, and he goes, and there, standing in front of my brother, 
He's like, was this creature. And he said that this thing had wings like a bat. It was beige in color. It was bald headed with what looked like really light fuzz, like light hair, like real light fuzz, like my words, not his. And he said, dude, it looked so creepy, dude. He goes, when it turned around, he, and this is what he told me. He says it had a mouthful of teeth. It were really sharp, needle-like, elongated teeth, but the, where the, you know, our canines are, whatever, it was really pronounced, really big. And so I asked him, I said, dude, he said it was bald-headed and it had these huge claws, but it was very skinny, right? And so I asked him, I said, dude, have you ever played uh, Mortal Kombat? He said, yeah. So was it, was it like Baraka? And so he looked him up and he goes, yes, yes, kind of like that. He kind of looked like Baraka. And so I thought, that is so creepy because that character- Oh, it's terrifying. It's terrifying looking. It's hideous. He's, he's hideous. He's it's creepy. Massive. So go look up Baraka and, and make his skin beige and you'll- Put some wings on it. With some wings. And he said it had a small, like where the tail, looked like the tailbone was, was like a nodule that came down. And he was completely, it was nude, this figure. And he said it had my brother cornered. He said, so I did what any good brother would do. I turned around and ran off. I was like, well, you're on your own, Hermano. So I'm just kidding. He didn't do that. He took a two by four and he banged it upside the head. And it didn't, it wasn't like indestructible. The creature didn't turn around and be like, oh, and then, you know, like the movies. He said it knocked it silly and it fell over, you know, and then it, but it got up quick, quick. you know, it rebounded, you know, and then it charged at him and then his brother hit it. And then next thing you know, and, and like he said, fortunately, uh, one of the workers had, had like, there was a tool belt there and a few other things that were there that had guy had left earlier and was going to come back. So he grabbed a hammer and his brother grabbed the wrench and they were like beating on this thing with it, you know, and they fought it off. And then eventually it flew out of an open window. It went into another room and found an open window and it flew out into the night. Um, and he, then he called and he told the superintendent, he said, I'm done. I am absolutely done. And who wouldn't be? And he, I go, whatever happened? He goes, I don't know. I, I never worked with the guy again. He said, but I don't think that the guy fully believed. He, if he did, he didn't let on. I think he thought that we were all just making this up. Or he was completely in complete denial. You know, as I told him, I said, some people are just willfully ignorant because it's easier to be that way. You know, and so he just chose to believe that it wasn't real. So I asked him, I said, you having lived in that area for a long time and now he did tell me of a guy that lived in the Basque region in between Spain and France. Now, the Basque are a different type of people. Um, I don't know if we know, like uh, uh, Rick Atrostain. Yeah. Like, okay, he's ba like Basque. So, one of the things that was told to me, he said, I had a friend that lived in the Basque region of Spain and he, and he on the Spain side, whatever. He said that it was a very creepy story. Um, that it snatched up his dog, a creature that was flying the exact same description. But the eyes, he, he could look up in the sky and he saw green glowing eyes. Like the eyes glowed green. It was very creepy. And he said, dude, I, I, don't, I don't know what to, to classify that or, you know, how to classify that. But he said, dude, it was just a, a very creepy creature. And he asked me if I'd ever heard of, of, Anything like that, you know, like like before, because this guy was recommended to me. He wasn't a, a listener of the show per se, and and I told him, I said, yeah, I've I've heard of creatures, flying creatures with green glowing eyes. That's not unheard of. We've heard this before here at Paranormal Roundtable. We've heard a lot of weird stories, and we do get probably more of these flying humanoid stories than the average podcaster, just because. We're, we're willing, willing to, yeah, yeah we're willing to, <laughs> to hear you out and not be told, oh, you're crazy. We don't want to hear that. You're crazy. You know, because people like to do that. It's just what they do. And, and, and so they get real, um, I don't know how you, how you say it. Like, uh, people get real <clears throat> snarky, you know, when you say it's a vampire because people want to believe a hundred percent the vampires don't exist. Well, the issue is, and I think this is an issue that leads over to Dogman as well, is that Hollywood and media has completely destroyed the, taken out like the ferocity that these things can happen. That's why we can't really call Dogman werewolves anymore because it makes you think of Hollywood Dogman or Hollywood werewolves. I'm pretty sure the same thing is, with, oh, when you say so, a vampire, they just think of Twilight where it's just supposed to be some sparkly 
you know, hot dude in the sun or whatever, or supposed to be some hidden, uh, attractive, uh, person just is a recluse that wants to shy away from drinking blood but does it anyway like they, they romanticize it so much that it takes away all the fear out of it so when you hear these stories of like these absolute monsters you can't really connect them with what you're, you know as a, a, a werewolf or what you know as a, as a vampire even though every sign points you that way <clears throat> yeah movies make it seem like like vampires are sexy or something. And yeah. They, and th- these things are... Parasites. Uh, yeah, they're parasites. They're unholy monsters. And I think it. I think there's also like a subconscious aspect to people denying it. Because if you think about it, it's easier to... It's probably easier to for human beings to accept the, the existence of Bigfoot and uh, werewolves than, than it is to accept vampires. Because if you see a Bigfoot then you know, oh, that this thing is not, this is a monster. If you see a werewolf, you know automatically, this is not a human being, this is a monster. But it's kind of unsettling to think that you could have seen multiple vampires throughout your life and not even know it. Mm. Because you could see one of these things and have no clue what you're actually, what you're actually looking at. You could genuinely believe that you're looking at a human being. Well, ignorance is bliss. So the thought that they walk among us just hidden is something that's very difficult to accept, whether people realize that that's their mindset or not, you know? Well, it's the same reason people don't want to believe in ghosts because they don't want to believe that all around us is our spirits just walking around. Yeah. Yep. Right. Ignorance is bliss. Yep. So moving on from there, I got another one. Uh, This one was in Brazil. This was out of a place called Campo Grande, and it's in southern, well, it's in, it's in southern Brazil, but Brazil's shaped kind of funny, so it's not all the way down at the bottom, and it's not down as far as Sao Paulo. Uh, Sao Paulo is down toward the bottom of Brazil, right before you get to the little, the little strip down there. Um, Camp, Campo Grande is, I believe, north, uh, east, um, or it's, uh, I know it is, it's northwest um, of... Uh, Sao Paulo. And this town apparently at one point had what they call the, the it's a hard to pronounce, the Lobosamum, which is like a werewolf type creature. They had a legend of that <clears throat> in this town. But there was also, right outside of this town, there was an, a, a case of, and, a, and it was like a small village that was being plagued by what they claimed to be was a vampire. And it was literally a woman who they said could shapeshift. And she was known as a witch. And one of the things that, that, that I was told by somebody who actually lived there, they lived through this, they said that one, that, that one day they were walking home from school and they were kids and it was it's still daylight outside. And this, they look up in the sky and they see Literally, what looks like a flying humanoid creature. I don't even know how to describe it. It was like a woman. It had hair, like a long hair, like a woman. And it was shrieking. And when they looked up, the hair was red, like bright red. And it was, they said it was, you know, and I guess if you put it into the, the, because we use the, uh, we don't use meters, you know, we don't use the metric system. But they said that it was like about 30 feet above them. And it swooped past him, and he said there was like six or seven of us kids. It was this guy, his sister, and his brother, and they all ran in different directions. And it literally sw- swooped down and tried to abduct and grab one of the girls, one of the little girls who was about five or six years old. And uh, they all started throwing rocks, and one of them managed to bing it right in the head, and it dropped her. And now he said that, you know, and, and this guy's like 35 years old now, but he was a little kid, you know, when this happened. But he said that, you know, he was like seven or eight. He goes, and so years later, he's like, we had all grown up with these stories of this uh, witch, you know, that, and, and then of course, you know, like that, that town was supposedly plagued by a werewolf type creature. Here's what's weird. The legends tell you, okay, that in, in Eastern Europe, and I actually talk about this in my book a little bit, I touch a touch on it. The, the legends say that some, some Eastern Europeans legends are that, that the, you're a werewolf. When you die, you become a vampire. Now, we also know that there are shapeshifters and there are legends of, of witches that can actually take on the form of animals and, and have familiars and things like that. 
So I asked this guy, uh, I'll call him Marquez. I asked him, I said, Mark, did, did you, did you, did you think there was a connection between, uh, this werewolf creature and this, uh, witch? And he said, yeah. He said, the stories were that there was this werewolf. It was a witch that could shape shift, but somebody shot and killed this, uh, werewolf. So this Lobosamum, uh, th th this creature that, that they claim is this werewolf, I, he did believe that it was the same creature when when it was shot when it was shot and killed. Now it's it, contrary to what they believe in some regions, they believe that this thing you, you can't bury a witch in consecrated ground, but they buried it in blessed ground so that it wouldn't return. That's what they were supposed to do. But they believed that there were people that were involved with this witch. And what ended up happening was they didn't, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. And they paid the undertaker and they set the body out somewhere so that they could revive it. I don't know how that worked. I don't know what kind of ritual they did. But for, for however this, this happened, this thing ended up moving out to the outskirts of this town of Campo Grande and ended up being like closer to his village. And he, ba he was basically, uh, in the belief that they all in that, in that village believed that this is what this was. It was the, the work of this witch and that she was able to shapeshift into this werewolf. But once she died and returned, she came back sort of as this winged demon. Um, and the only difference was that she could be a, a woman that looked kind of like a zombie. Um, and she lived down the outskirts of town out in the middle of the woods and she didn't wear clothes. And then sometimes she was seen as with having wings and flying around with humongous fangs. And every now and then they would find a cow or a goat or something that was exsanguinated. And that, that was the creepy thing about it was that, uh, the exsanguination, I mean, when you, uh, think about an entire cow being exsanguinated, like, <laughs> how does that work? I mean, obviously, yeah, that's um, insane. That's a that's a large animal to just drain of all of its blood. Yeah, so it, it, it's 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 one of those things where she she was literally blamed for this, and he's like, if I wouldn't have seen it with my own eyes as a child, I would never have believed it. Now, here's the other thing that happened: his mother was out one night, and she was they had they had some goats, and her his mother was out milking a goat. And she hears this shriek and she looks up in the sky and it, it happened at night and she sees this, like what looked like a witch, kind of a hag looking creature. It had to be the same exact thing he saw when he was a kid. This thing had been around forever and it swooped down. And at the moment that, that it tried to attack his mom, he was gone. He had moved away and got a job. He moved to Sao Paulo and his mother was, was older, you know, and her, his dad had passed away. So his mom's brother had come to live and work on the farm, whatever. And he shot this thing. Like it swooped down at his mom and he shot it. He claimed to have blown part of its face, like just knocked it right off. And then it disappeared into the night, but it kept flying. And he's like, what kind of creature can take a gunshot, a, a shotgun to the face and get half its face blown off and just continue to fly and, and, and disappear into the night. And he asked me that question. I said, not many things can do that, if any at all. I like, could do a, it. Not a, <laughs> not a physical creature, you know. No, and not. so I asked him, I said, do you believe that this uh, vampire witch creature was physical or spiritual? And he answered uh, quickly. He said, I think it's both. It's a supernatural creature that had assumed the form of some sort of spirit. Now, the question, though. And that's all he knew about. It, it was no more uh, anything to it. Uh, he thinks that it, that may have actually done it in. Like it went somewhere, maybe it died or it went to greener pastures. I don't know. But uh, he, he said that it, that it had attacked multiple livestock and that there were a couple children that had gone missing. It was it was crazy. You know, some people, there was a woman that was walking along the road one day and she just was gone. I mean, it was like, and they they blamed it on this creature. You know, of course, you know, it's going to make like the tabloids or something, but it's not going to be major headlines, you know, in the United States, you know, or anything like that. We're not going to know about it. 
Um, but I, I do believe him, and I think what he's what he's saying is true. This really did happen. Um, and he's like, yeah, it was crazy. And then his his older brother, for years, um, was was plagued by dreams and nightmares about what had happened. That thing swooping in. And at one point, he he had a very vivid dream of this thing coming through the window and crawling in. And the the lower body of this creature would turn into a snake, and it would try to slither into his bed, and he would wake up. And he asked me if that could have been something. I said, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> this thing was probably moving along in the astral plane, you know, to do whatever it was doing. It, it is a very scary uh, thought, you know. Now, is that a vampire? And I don't know. It's some kind of demonic entity. And is this, was this woman's uh, body just a vessel for demons or was she a demon? I mean, you know, what are these things? Now, if you listen to the live stream, I'm going to jump ahead here for a minute. There was a story that we got from an alien abductee. And well, before I, I, I go into that, we'll get into that. What do you guys think about this one? I mean, what, do you, what are your thoughts on it? I think like dogmen, we have to have a clearer way to differentiate what a vampire is. I think it's very... You know, even though when you say vampire, people have a general idea of like what you're talking about. I think it's still a bit too broad. Well, dog man too. Yeah, you're right. It's yeah. Just... It's, it's, it's clear that, you know, there's certain aspects that these things have that would classify them as vampires. You know, the, the uh, sanguination, for example, or the fangs, for example. But it's very clear that they're not like your Hollywood vampires where they're just people regular people that just are undead and that they they suck on blood and that they're just living around with us forever these are very clearly like monsters that do the same thing and i think well that's one of the reasons people are so turned away is because like when you say vampire their immediately idea in their the first thought that comes to their head is oh i'm just looking for like dave or or michael and he has extra long fangs and he doesn't like sunlight he doesn't like garlic and he never knows what he looks like because mirrors don't like him either. <laughs> it's, it's, once again, it's like it's deeper than that. There's a lot more going on. And I'm like, you know, you, you hear it's too prevalent in history. Too many cultures, too many things have different versions of bloodsuckers. That's plain and simple. That it would be remiss for anybody to be like, oh, they, they're, uh, this thing doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a creature mm -hmm. that lives by drinking the blood of other things. It doesn't make sense. Well, what, how do you tell that to literally every one of our ancestors? Like you can't. And just because now, you know, you're, we're coming out with stories of these wing-like creatures and these all these other creatures, but I'm listening to these and the first thing I think of is like, oh, that kind of think, makes me think of a story or uh, of a myth back in the in in whatever from here or here or, or you know like when you told those stories of people who are just floating heads or just floating torsos and stuff like that. That's like a really prevalent story in Japan and China and stuff like that. It's like Jason Bland when he mm -hmm. was on the show, he talked about the floating yeah. head. Yeah, yeah. Those are like stories that that are been told for years, been told as scary stories, been told as just like oh these are creatures that exist. So like. It, but it's very clear that f different areas have like different types, you know. Like I said, the. But do you think heads. this thing was a demon? I mean, I don't know what it is, but I think if we could figure out a better way to classify these things, then it would help us bring more, bring them to light better. Because, like you said, you know, it's one of the hardest part about when you get these stories is like, how do I classify this? How do I w this? How do I bring this into something so that I can understand what I'm talking about, or at least I could compare it to other things that are similar enough to where like this, these well, that's things. That's why I think that story on the live stream was so important. Mm -hmm. What if these things aren't actually immortal like, like we think them to be? What if these vampires are actually just, what if the body of these vampires is actually just a host for a malevolent the, uh, the, demon spirit entity mm -hmm. and it's just that as long as they live you know, that we would perceive that as immortality, but in reality, th these these spirits, they have lifespans that span thousands and thousands of years, but eventually they will die. But, you know, for, for, for us, 
they're always going to be alive. So we just see it as as immortal. And and the 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 person who was uh, in that body originally, the person who was born as that as into they that body, the soul yeah, is gone. Yeah, they're they're gone. Their soul is dead and gone, and has moved they're on to where to wherever it's at. Walking. Yeah, and all, all that's left is their body. And it's completely possessed by by this demon, but but of course, since that this demon or spirit is in that body, they're going to still have that person's memories and genetic proclivities. But that it, it's still it's not them. Well, and so so it, it's not like it's a person who is undead because that person, their soul is dead and gone, and and it's not actually something that's immortal. It's just that we perceive it as immortal because they live for so long. Well, it's funny is there's, there's a show called The Strain, and they, their idea of vampires isn't actually the person. The person is just a host, and what they consider the, the virus. It's a, like a, it's literally like a parasite. parasite it's like these little okay, worm-like yeah, yeah. things. I think it was, okay. it's basically like it's on the same thing. It's like, what if it's instead like a virus or like a parasite, something that inhabits different bodies, and that's why. You know, you, you, it's, it's literally, like, or even a curse. What if it's something that could be put upon someone and then they slowly turn into this thing and then they lose all their rationale, all those Humanity's things. gone. Humanity, yeah. And it, it could turn them into vampires. But it's not that they themselves are a vampire. It's whatever they're inhabiting or whatever's like forcing them to become Like whatever is inhabiting them, Yeah, I mean. Yeah. yeah, it's not really like that, you know, you can become a vampire. It's more like you're cursed with it instead. Mm. Well, let, let's get into this story that we, we talked about this a few weeks ago on the show. And, and and by the show, I mean the live stream. And a lot of people that are listening to us right now on the podcast, they don't listen to the live stream, unfortunately. And, and if you don't, you should. And this was like, a, I think, a, a Sunday where we tell stories. We just do what we're doing right now, but we tell them live on the show Sunday. And uh, we're going to talk on this, the, the one coming up on this coming uh, – or, or no, the one that, that just passed this Sunday should have or it should have been told – um, we're going to tell some stories about mer creatures, but uh, I'm not real sure if that'll be if that would have already happened or it will happen as of, as of if you're listening to this right now. But you'll know if you listen to the live stream. But very very uh, weird thing we talked about, and I'm going to just give an overview of it. If you want the whole story, go to the live stream and find it. We were talking about an ab alien abductee. And it was very, uh, what they had gone through was very just, I mean, it was crazy. They had been taken aboard what they believed was a ship, but we also discussed the possibility that it could have just been a facility. And in the facility, y'all remember, it was like a shield or something um, that was invisible. A and barrier. Like a barrier, yeah. And they were being walked through this menagerie of creatures. And one of the creatures that they saw was this weird looking sh creature that was like kind of hunched over and it was clutching its legs and it looked ancient to the to this person that was watching it. And the alien that was walking with them said that the because they stopped and they just looked at this creature and they said, oh, you're observing this uh, being. And it says, you know, this being, it, it, what, what is it? And the aliens, they asked that. And the alien said, this is this creature – Came here, and if I remember correctly, they said it came here like a hundred something thousand years ago or something. It was that old, this species. And it said that if this thing right here, that particular one, was loosed upon the earth, that it could spread a disease that would wipe out humanity within, you know, like you know, like years. And if I remember, isn't that, isn't that the story? I believe that yeah. is what they yeah. said. Because I don't have the notes for that in front of me, but that's what did, that did was. Did they say years or days? I thought it was years, but I mean, it might have been. I mean, if you go back and listen to it, it was one of the ones about alien abduction. If you follow the live streams, it's you, you'll understand. But it's crazy, though. I mean, you know, that could be. It could be something that. Sh and, they, and they said it came to Earth like a hundred thousand years ago, whatever. It could be something like that, right? And then there could be a watered down bloodline that came from that. Now. Here's another weird story. This one came out of France, and this was in Paris. And it ties into that because and, – and, and Tony, you remember how we were talking earlier about dogs not liking certain people? And I've been this, – this story is very – this one I think was really fascinating. This was a woman that told me this story. She's French, and uh, I met her through one of my, one of my friends who – 
she's Arabic. She speaks Arabic, but she's 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 a French citizen. She lives in she lived in she lived in France. She only lives there now, but she lived in France for a long time with her boyfriend who was French, and they had a really really weird encounter with a neighbor who would ask for favors and all kinds of stuff, and and they were always compelled to do. For this neighbor to even so far as to give them their vehicle, which he wrecked and the boyfriend was infuriated with this guy. But then when he would come up with whatever lame excuse he had, they would always be like, oh, okay. And then they'd walk away with this feeling that they'd just been duped. But then when they went to confront the guy, it would always happen all over again that this person would just talk real soothing to them and, and just kind of, they'd get off, you know, the, the, he'd get off the hook. Sounds very much like an energy vampire. But I think it was more than that because eventually her and her boyfriend began to fight and their relationship broke down and eventually they separated. And she was from, uh, not Libya, um, she was from Algeria and she was Algerian. And, 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 and this guy, he spoke perfect Arabic, but he wasn't a French citizen. He claimed that he was from Belgium, but he spoke German, he spoke French, he spoke Arabic, he spoke all these languages. And he knew all this stuff, and supposedly he had lived in Turkey at one point, and he had all these different friends, uh, one of whom claimed that he was a, an Albanian um, and who had come around sometimes, and they were both very pale. Another weird thing. And she said that one day she he came over and, and offered her some wine, and she was lonely. She had been separated from her boyfriend for a couple months. Boyfriend had moved back to, uh, I think, I think he was living somewhere in the, in the south, southern region of France, whatever he had, he had left and was living out in the countryside and, and they were separated and she had kind of stuck around in the hopes that they would get back together and it never materialized. And so she was kind of, you know, depressed. And so she became friends with this guy and this guy would come around and, and one of the things he would do he would bring her food and wine and cheese and things like that, but he would never eat it. She thought that was weird. He would drink the wine. And she thought that the wine tasted a little bit salty. And it was it was weird. She said it was a little bit salty. And then one day, get this, she she's cutting some fruit. She she cuts her finger and she puts her finger in her mouth. And she's like, that's what that is. She's like, it tastes like blood. Iron. Yeah, and she she also I must probably note this. She's vegetarian, so she didn't really eat meat. Uh, so she hadn't eaten meat she said, in thirteen years. So she didn't know much about the, you know, the flavor. She never ate much of be- much beef, and she's like, uh, she said it tasted like the wine. So when he came over with the wine, um, he gave her some, and she was like, "This tastes like blood." She could taste the the, the hint of it in there, and she knew something wasn't right. And so she questioned him and she's like, if I didn't know any better, because the wine was addicting. She had gotten bottles of it and she was just drinking it and she, and she wasn't getting drunk from it. That's what's weird too. And so she thought that it was, there was something going on there. And when she questioned this guy, he got really upset. Well, then she gets a dog and she has a dog and he came over and the first time and it was a uh, rescue. First time he came over, the dog had never been aggressive at all. It was a Pomeranian, and but it was very, it was half Pomeranian, half something else. But she said it was a very good natured, calm dog, whatever. And one day he came over and the dog just flipped out and just wanted to tear that guy apart. And she's like, her girlfriends had come over and her brother and her friends and everything. Nothing, nothing. But that guy, it was like that dog just flipped out on him and just, just did not like him. Would And it would go to the door and growl. Another thing that was weird, I thought that was that was probably uh, of note, was that she started having these weird dreams. And when she had these dreams, she would she would feel like something was in the room with her when she would wake up, and then it would kind of like disappear real fast. I got a story from somebody. Uh, this one happened in o- up in Ohio, uh, and it was very it was very weird. It, this is a quick little story, a little sideline about, and we're going to do one about this kind of stuff about mirrors. And this guy had was having dreams, and he had this girlfriend. And one day, he sees, like clear as day, he's laying in his bed, and he could see into his bathroom of his apartment, and and, and just you know, he sees this like a woman like walking through the mirror. He had like this really big mirror in his master bathroom, 
He had a roommate, um, but he had the master bathroom and, and there was like a communal bathroom and then another room. And he said, dude, I'm sitting there watching TV, literally just watching the football game. This happened in Cincinnati, Ohio. And he said, I see my girlfriend. It's a woman. And I look and it's, it's my girlfriend walking through the mirror. Like, yeah, I'm like, wow. She just, he thought, man, I was, if I didn't know anybody, I would have been, I thought I was dreaming. I was sitting there watching this. It was clear as day. <clears throat> so he calls her and she's like, hey, what's up? Like, you know, and, and he said that he, little by little, it started to come out. And I'm going to get into this story on the show eventually. And he said, dude, it was like, he knew immediately. He knew that she was doing something. And, it, and of course, th there was this whole weird thing where she would never eat. You know what I mean? So I kind of thought about that. It, it brought that to mind, you know, uh, about the whole whatever. Well, the same thing happened to her. She was having these weird dreams. And at one point, she went into the bathroom and she thought she saw the guy standing behind her in the mirror. And she looked. She was like, whoa. So little by little, she, he creeped her out. and. I'm just going to be honest. They had been, they had started seeing each other, you know, and, and, but he was always entertaining, always having women over at his apartment or whatever. And sometimes it seemed like he had big parties or whatever. And there was like a steady stream of people coming in out of his apartment. And then one day she saw the French police there knocking on his door and they kicked the door in. She didn't know what was going on. And there was nothing there. the The apartment was empty, and she was looking out the peephole. And she went out into the to the hallway, and they asked if she knew him. She said, "Yeah, I know him. He was my friend." And they're like, "Well, he's we're looking for him in connection to a disappearance." And apparently, you know, somebody had reported that he was the last person to be seen with this person. I don't know the whole. She didn't know the whole story about it. It freaked her out. And then after that, she moved because it was so weird. But this guy had apparently, you know, as, as some people would say, glamored her, you know, because when they showed her, get this, this is the weirdest part right here. When they showed her a picture of the guy, he was hideous. And she's like, that kind of looks like him, but not really. And they're like, and then they showed her other pictures of him. Then she goes onto her Facebook with this guy. And all the pictures on there were ugly. He was just ugly, like almost like a <laughs> the way she said, like she, and, and and she didn't speak real good English, but she said like a troll. He looked like a troll, ugly little troll. And she thought he was the most handsome, most beautiful guy she'd ever seen. And uh, she asked me how that would be possible that somebody could make themselves look pretty, you know, good looking guy, whatever. And turned out there was another woman in the complex that lived right down the hall who he was doing the same thing with her. And they were both taken aback by how ugly he really was. Fast forward, she moved away. Fast forward about two years and a chance encounter um, in another uh, French uh, town, a small little, little uh, village. And she runs into him. And he's driving a moped. And he's that same handsome, dashing looking guy, whatever. And she just, she starts talking to him and she's just taken in by him. So they go, he's, he's like, come, he's like, come back. I got a little, uh, uh, Airbnb, whatever, like a little place he'd rented for the night or whatever. They went back to this little, as she described it, like a chateau little place. And she says, and they began to make out whatever. She looks in the mirror and she sees his back. It's covered in like these spots. And when he turns his head, she sees the side of his face. And she said that she could see it. It was terrible. His teeth were yellowy and he had these enormous looking fangs sticking out the top of it. And the next thing you know, he opens his mouth and she like closes her eyes because she's terrified. And then she don't remember anything at that point. She wakes up in the morning and the guy is gone. But she's got these two bruises, not, not, and here's what's weird, not puncture marks, mind you, but just bruises on her neck. Like, like kind of made me think, what if he bit her and then he healed? You know how vampire bats do that? It's weird. Like, and they can. Yeah. 
and then it healed. And then, and, and so I don't know, like maybe it just, you know, it's, I don't know, like, and she, but she felt tired and drained and eventually she ended up having to go to the hospital and they gave her, uh, what do you call that? Uh, an IV. They said she was dehydrated. She was suffering from dehydration and she thought that he had done something to her. And so, and she said her dog never liked that dude. And I said, well, if you already knew that he was being looked at by the French police and you knew that he was some sort of, uh, you know, derelict and he was, you know, creepy looking, freaky uh, looking, freaky guy, weird, messing around with other women too. And he was, she's like, I don't know. Every time I talked to him, it was like, he was just, I couldn't, I couldn't say no to him for anything. So, you know, is that, or was that a vampire? I mean, that is the question. I mean, when she told me that and, and I don't know. I mean, it's like so hard to wrap my mind around, you know? And like I said, she was introduced to me by an Arabic friend of mine and just, he said, man, I know this girl's got a really freaky story. You talk to her and she, she, I, she asked me, she goes, was he a vampire? I said, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, was it? Is that a vampire? Was that a vampire? All you, the signs would point you to think one, but at the same time, it's like, how can you be so sure? You know, yeah. it's like, what if, what if we're talking about a bunch of different creatures that all kind of do the same thing of of drinking blood, but the way they do it all differs. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, in the first story, you could have an extremely aggressive bat-like creature that goes in and attacks and like, they just, they kill whatever they drink or you could have something like this which uses more subterfuge and and glamour and magic to make people like to try to live in between society it's like what if those are entirely two different things that you know you you, you ever um you know vampire masquerade the game the game uh yeah scorpion i think used to play it well, in, in that game, like, there was a bunch of different clans of vampires. You know, they all do different things. Some of them are, like, more magical. Some of them are more primal. You know, some of them are more feral. Like, no, like they had, look like more like Nosferatu and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like, it could be something like that to where it's just, overall, yeah, if you look at them all, like, the, yeah. So there's, like, different types. Different yeah, types. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that breaks down to that. But here's another element to this. <clears throat> One of the people in her apartment building you should bartend at a, at a club down in in, in, uh, in Paris. And she said that that, that girl knew this guy <clears throat> and she point blank told him to, or told her that he was a reptile, mm. which is really weird. Um, and she's like, what do you mean? She's like, like a lizard. Literally. He's like a reptile, like a lizard because she had seen him, uh, the side of his face morph into scales when he was on drugs one time. Now, I asked her, I said, when you looked at him in the mirror at that chateau in that little village or whatever, I can't remember the name of the town she was in, but she said, uh, she said, uh, it was like, I don't remember the name of the, it was close to, I think, All Saints or something like that. Um, I think that was the name of the place, but it was like the village was outside of there. She said that that, when she looked in the mirror, she did see a yellowish scale looking like scales and those spots on his back. That was what that was. It was like, it was almost like he had really bad psoriasis, but it wasn't psoriasis. It was like, the, you know how they get the scales from psoriasis? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I told her, I said, I honestly think that you were dealing with some sort of reptilian vampiric type creature. Now you were talking about immortality, Anthony. One of the things that I think is striking is that you hear about these blood drinking vampires and we can't say too much because, you know, we, we, we can't, but we know a lot of stuff that, that, that I do, um, that these things, uh, will take certain parts of humans to make them, to give them longevity, right? And that could be part of the whole immortality thing. They've got that part figured out. And as long as they use that part of the human they stay young and do what they do. Right. That, that's interesting. That in itself is interesting, but that I'm still like shocked by that reptilian thing. Cause it then leads credence to what we were talking about earlier about it, maybe being a parasite or a curse or, you know, some kind of disease or something. Cause then it's like, yeah, why wouldn't it affect other humanoids? He wasn't a big guy either. I asked about how, what he looked like, dark hair, dark eyes, really pale skin, um, looked, now she said when in the pictures 
that they showed her, his skin almost looked yellowish, like he had hepatitis or jaundice or something. You know what I mean? Like he looked really weird and he looked sickly. Maybe the pictures, you know, told the truth. But he was able to to, to glam you know, whoever, glamour, whatever you call it, you know, to, to whatever they call it. I don't know the exact name, terminology of the what vampires call that, but being able to 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 fool the right people, you know, and and did he did he take blood from her? He allowed her to live, you know. So I asked her. I said, "Have you since then? Have you ran into?" She's like, "No, I moved to Belgium." Um, she's living with a friend of hers over there, but, uh, yeah, it was a very, uh, and she was very somber. You know, when she talked the story, it wasn't like she was like all upbeat and excited. She sounded like somebody who just been through the ringer. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. It's like, it's what's weird. Cause it's like the only thing that really connects these two stories is really the fact that we know about vampires, but if like we had no prior knowledge these are two entirely different creatures. They kind of, you know, do kind of something similar about drinking blood, but they don't seem to have anything respectively that you would be like, oh yeah, these two are connected somehow. But because we have that pre-notion of vampires, it makes us think that they, they're connected. But yeah, they could I mean, just be entirely two different things. Like, like, Yeah, because blood magic is... is pretty much a universal thing whether it comes to like vampires or witches or other kind of black magic practitioners it's easy to say like if something drinks blood then it's automatically a vampire but but blood is is just it's commonly used with any kind of dark arts or monsters what have you i mean like a reptilian or 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 like a warlock you know witch whatever they still have the same vested interest in obtaining blood that mm -hmm. a vampire does it's just the way they use it is probably what differs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we know in, in the Bible, I mean, when it talks about it, it says the blood is the life. You know, I mean, it is, it's true. I mean, blood is your life force. And whether it's spiritual or physical, it's taking something from you, you know, and, and taking blood would be, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it gets really weird. She had a bunch of questions that I couldn't answer, you know, at least not at this point. But I was just like, you know, it, it gets – the deeper you go, it's like there's more questions than answers. You can postulate on theories all day long. But what at the end of the day, what are we dealing with? And like Tony said, I mean, there could be multiple different types, layers of these creatures. Different layer upon layer. Entirely two different things. It's like that, that's what's scary, I think, even more so than dogmen – is that vampire is such a loose term for a creature that we don't really understand. And then our understanding of that creature kind of boxes it in, in a way to where like we were looking, like when you're looking for like a very specific type of thing, but at the end of the day, like what they do and, and, and the stories you hear, you can't describe them as anything else is like, yeah, you know, bat like wings, huge fangs drink the blood oh vampire but that's a big old monster and then you hear this story reptile looking thing you know bit me on the neck i have two marks so it probably i feel very faint and i need an iv it's like what, and it's even weirder because it wasn't even punctured. glamour i mean it's like it's all there these no things. puncture mark yeah it's, 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 it's just it's just like i don't know how to describe it but it, it always it, it, vampires always boggle me because of the variety of stories you get. And I think it's one that people scoff at a lot. And, and that, yeah, that's they don't another wanna, they one. Don't, they act like it's a joke. Mm -hmm. I mean. It's a dang shame. It, 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 it's horrible because, you know, you man, like the one we got from uh, uh, Emilio, from the, the, when he was talking about going to, um, was it him? It was, I think it was the one that was in, in uh, he went into that nightclub with his friends. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he went into that to that nightclub in New it, Orleans. Yeah, in in New Orleans, and it it got too hot and heavy for him. It it just it didn't feel right. And then they left and went back to their hotel room. And then the next day, they went to the exact same spot where that club nothing was, was, and there. nothing was there. Yeah, yeah. And and there was another guy that had given me a story. A guy named David who had that had happened to him, and he, he was down in Israel, and it happened. And he was down, I think, in like Tel Aviv or something, and they were partying in some like big warehouse kind of place or whatever. And he said that they, he was there visiting his cousins or whatever. And like same thing happened. 
Like he thought there was something weird going on that there were these really big, tall, it was like there were three like really tall guys that looked kind of out of place and everybody was kind of like kind of around them, you know, dancing around. And these three guys, they, they were like, he thinks they were just like passing out something, some kind of substance, right? And then next thing you know, a bunch of people took off with them. And then he goes the next day to go back to where that place was. And it was just an empty building. There was nothing there. And he goes, who, who were those big, tall guys? They were all about six foot six. There were three of them. And when he started going over there to check it out, the girl that he was with grabbed his arm and said, no, 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 don't do that. Don't go with those guys. And they're like, who are they? She goes, I don't know. But I can, I, I can tell you this. There's, there's, they're bad. And he just said, oh, okay. Because he's an American, you know, and, and even though he speaks a little bit of Hebrew, he's not real versed and he didn't know a whole lot about, you know. But it was he was telling me that. And I was just like, dude, that's crazy. You know, I mean, I don't know. I mean. Well, vampires in themselves are an absolute abomination in my eyes because of the fact that they can't survive without drinking the blood of a parasite. Yeah. And at the end of the day, like if they get their way, they will too die. If they drink, you know, if they wipe out humanity by using well, their it as plan cattle. Isn't to do that. They're just using Yeah. But like, that's the thing is like anything where you have to have like, are you, where you're so reliant on life's blood of something else as soon as that thing gets wiped out, then you too as well. Then, then you're just like an abomination. You're yeah. not meant to be. You, sh if you can't exist purely using yourself without relying on an external force like that, I feel like. And you're there's not just something so like sinister about parasit parasitism. You know, it's like it's like we have this special hatred for it. You know, it's like a tick. Mm -hmm. You just hate ticks because they they suck blood. You know, and it's like. When you, when you get one on your dog, like I can't kill it enough, dude. Oh, like I mean, burning like, it is not even enough. Nope. for me. You know? Like I, I don't like blood bugs, but any parasites in general, I, I general, would yeah. like. I wish I could cause them the pain for some some yeah, way, like a tick or a bed bug or, or something. Or you know? something. Yeah, it's just like, horrible. That's like pretty much the only thing that'll trigger like a, sad, a sadistic streak in me. It's like getting a hold of a tick or a bed bug or a mosquito or something. Any, mm -hmm. any kind of blood sucker is just like it's, it's sickening, gross. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, folks, that was that's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you for tuning in to Paranormal Roundtable. Don't forget to get your tickets to the conference. We're going to talk about all this kind of stuff. It's crazy stuff, man, but it's real. We're not joking. We're not playing around, man. This, these people are experiencing something, and uh, I wish more people would be talking about it and, and wake up to the reality of, of what's going on, whether it's ghosts, dogman, Bigfoot, vampires, alien abduction. It's all happening. And, um, yeah, check out Paranormal Roundtable. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for tuning in. Josh Turner, Wolf, they call me, and Anthony and Tony. Good night.